Before we get to the episode, we want you, dear listener, to ask yourself a question. What have you done these past two years? You know, the pandemic hit us all really hard. What have you really done other than perfect that matzo ball soup recipe of yours? Nothing. Now, we all want to add purpose and meaning to our life, and we just, we have the way to really, really make your dreams come true. If you're listening, you're likely interested in Israel with hopes of traveling here soon. Well, lucky for you, we've got the scoop on Masai Israel journey. With an amazing range of life-changing opportunities in Israel, Masai has many, many programs. They've got gap year programs, academics, internships, volunteering, and careers. The pandemic didn't stop them either, promoting options to study remotely while living in Israel. You don't have to be fluent in Hebrew or break your bank account. They even supply partial funding so you can make a positive impact on the world. You can fuel your passion and you can make your travel dreams a reality. Go to MasaIsrael.org and find out more. This is Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. collaboration with Australian Jewish News. Check them out at ajn.timesofisrael.com. Also in collaboration with Arutz Sheva, israelnationalnews.com. There are few people on this planet as industrious creative, and philanthropic as our guest today. After making Aliyah from South Africa in 1956 with his wife, he had several less than successful business ventures, including a bicycle factory and a cow farm. But these did not deter Morris Khan. Morris Khan went on to found Golden Pages Israel, Amdocs, and of course, Space IL, which launched Bereshit to the moon in 2019. Khan has dedicated decades of his life and vast amounts of his wealth to philanthropy and child health care. He helps bring elite Israeli doctors around the world to save children's lives through the Save a Child's Heart organization. He supports medical research, including some amazing breakthrough cancer research at Tel Aviv University, and he does so much more. If we tried to cover even 5% of his generosity, we'd be here until tomorrow, and then we'd miss the pleasure of talking to the man himself. We are thrilled, we are honored to be joined today on the podcast by Morris Khan. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. That's quite an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, you live up to every word, so uh, it, you know it, it had to be done. Yeah. Tell us a little bit. Maybe we can start off by you telling us a little bit about growing up in uh, South Africa. Okay, well, <clears throat> basically, uh, I come from a little town in South Africa, not far from Johannesburg, the, uh, the main commercial city in, J in South Africa. Uh, I came from a, from a poor family. My father was a miner. He, when I tell people my father was a miner, they said, did he own the mine? And I said, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he didn't own the mine. He worked supervising a gang of people dr drilling the rock in the gold mines. A very menial job. Um, we were actually... Very uh, dangerous job, probably, no? A very dangerous job, probably. It was a dangerous job, 6,000 feet underground, uh, Ventilation was bad, conditions were very difficult, but uh, that's how he could make a living. And we never went, we never wanted anything. We, we never, as children, we never suffered from what, but we were actually part of the poorer community in South Africa. Really? So I grew up, I was in school, I was quite bright, and uh, everything was going fine until the final year. Uh, I failed my matric. Uh, Afrikaans is a is a prerequisite. My skill in languages is not good. Having failed in Afrikaans, one of the languages, that put me back for a year. It was very disappointing, discouraging. I got jobs for a couple of two years after after school, and um, then somebody discovered me. Uh, I'd worked in a, in a youth movement, and 
which promoted people to come to Israel. And uh, I said, if you want them to come to Israel and you want them to be chalutzim, work on the land, uh, we should not just talk to them. We should let them work with their hands and give them an experience of actually working. And uh, some professor at university saw what I'd done, was impressed, said, you need to go to university. I told him I couldn't afford it. So he arranged for me to get a, a scholarship from a very wealthy Zionist in South Africa. We had a big argument because I wanted to do social science, and he said that was not a profession. <laughs> and uh, he would not agree to give me a bursary to go to study social science. He said to become a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist, something real, which is probably practical advice. Even a minor. <laughs> <laughs> and he was actually right, really. Anyway, as life, as life happens, the uh, government changed in South Africa. I had joined the Communist Party. I actually enjoyed, I joined the party because I was disturbed at the relationship between the whites and the blacks. And I felt that actually communism would have a more a more equal and a more civilized society, and we could actually help the, these people who were actually underprivileged. Did you encounter anti-Semitism growing up in South Africa? Uh, not really. Uh, you know, the Afrikaners actually uh, really regarded the, the Jews as, uh, as the people of the Bible. And uh, I personally didn't really encounter a lot. Uh, I used to go to a Hebrew school. Uh, coming from the Hebrew Hebrew school, a couple of hooligans would actually molest us. Uh, but um, apart from that, I never really felt anti-Semitism in growing up. And how you mentioned the, the joining the Communist Party. How, how do you, looking back, kind of, how do you feel about that? What are your <coughs> views on it well, today? Look, I, under, I now understand that actually where I was, I was a young person. I was idealistic. Uh, I, felt I, I felt the Communist Party would change society for the better. I wasn't a Marxist in, in the sense of uh, supporting Soviet Russia and Soviet communism. I was looking for more of a, more of a, more of a civil society. Mm-hmm. And a it solution was, it to was the problem. Bit, it was a little bit naive, yeah. because the Communist Party really had another objective. But it kind of, for you, it was the ones that were at the forefront of battling this, this horrible atrocity that was happening, which is the, right, the racism that existed in South yes. Africa, and that seemed the best way at the time. It seemed to me that that would be a solution to this racial problem in, in South Africa. I see. So you're coming to Israel, you're making Aliyah. Can you tell us about your biggest business failure? Well, uh, <laughs> well, first of all, I want to tell you, I came to Israel uh, to have a look-see when I was 60, when I was actually uh, 25. What year? Was it? 1965. 19, 1955. Ah, f- I, came on a, I came on a visit. Uh, How now, was Israel? Can you describe the Israel yes, you saw? Yes, I can, I can, I can. Because people Israel, don't... Yeah. Israel was actually, uh, you know, quite primitive. Things were really sort of pretty raw. Uh, I didn't speak the language. I didn't like the culture. I didn't like the food, but I actually felt at home. For some strange reason, I felt at home. Um, I, 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 I was in a Zionist youth movement, but really it was kind of a, almost a spiritual thing that I actually felt at home. I went back to South Africa, sold my businesses, and uh, came, came to settle in Israel with a young wife and uh, two children, one was three and the other was one and a half. Um, a little money in my pocket, I, I joined a moshav, uh, an agricultural settlement. Uh, for a year I worked at farming, you know, watering the orange grove, raising chickens, 
uh, I found it quite challenging and quite exhilarating. It, it, because it was different. I, I had no experience in, in farming. So it lived up to kind of what you were hoping when you, when you decided to pick up your stuff in South Africa and move here. It lived up to that. Um, what led up to my coming to Israel was one, I had two young children and felt that for them there was no future in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I actually felt at the time that actually the white minority community, ultimately the Africans would take over. And I felt that there was, because of the anger between and the tension between the, between the races, I felt that there was no real future for them. Mm -hmm. I decided to, to leave South Africa and come to Israel and, and work for our own country and actually build and uh, contribute to making Israel really a great successful again. country. <laughs> making yeah. it great again. Uh, to make Israel great again. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, to really to make Israel survive. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you ended up moving here, you moved to the Moshav, and then as we mentioned, and as Noah asked about, you had some uh, less than successful business ventures. Oh, really? Uh, first, first of all, I became, uh, I, I, I did a whole lot of things, one of which was to um, bring in a new breed of chickens in, into Israel. It was a dominant white rock we managed to. I, I, I became a partner in an incubating business. We got a breed of chickens from the United States, a dominant white rock, and uh, they were very popular, but I had a fallout with my partners, so that didn't work out. Um, I had a cattle ranch. We had a cattle ranch in northern Galilee. Uh, I had 80,000 dollars of land that I was grazing. 4,000 head of cattle, that's a very big project. Um, wow. But um, it wasn't really financially successful. We were on border, we were on the border between Lebanon on one side, Jordan on the other side, and uh, our cattle were, a bit, were actually being stolen, there were diseases. Um, I wasn't really a farmer, let's face <laughs> it. <laughs> then, I, uh, then I helped put up a bicycle factory, a very big bicycle factory in Bed Shemesh, together with, the, uh, to, together with Kibbutz Zora. How did you come up with the idea? I didn't come up with the idea. The Kibbutz came up with the idea. And um, uh, I had uh, bicycle shops in South Africa before mm. I came to Israel. And... Uh, I had a little bit of experience, and they ran into a problem that they had no money. So I said I'd go back to South Africa with, with one of the members of the kibbutz, and we raised money and we built a bicycle factory. It was a very modern bicycle factory. We produced almost everything for bicycles. And uh, that, that was our big mistake, because bicycles <laughs> aren't made that way. You've got to... The uh, bicycle factory will buy the frames from one, one place and rims from another place and pedals from another place and really assemble them and just do a little bit of work. Because but each we, part needs expertise, basically. Yeah, we, had, we had no real expertise. You know, we, the three of us were young, were young people with zero experience in industry. We had no technological experience. We had no business experience, but we had a lot of guts and uh, a lot of chutzpah. And, uh, Which is essential for business we, it and is. riding a bike. We built, we built a very big factory. It was very modern. It did everything. And it provided employment for the new immigrants that were coming in and settled in Beit Shemesh. So it did its job. But we didn't make money. So I got to ask you about these uh, ventures. I mean, at any point, like, do you remember the feeling after each one, after the, the fail, the, like the, the venture not being profitable and the sense of failure? Like, do you remember that feeling? Did you have a sense of failure? Um, you know, I was never sort of oppressed by the failure. But failure was something that happened. 
uh, it just happened. And uh, you just look at it and say, okay, now what do I do now? And uh, you look around and, and somehow you see where, where fate and uh, circumstances take you and you just move on. Uh, at some point, uh, I became an investment counsellor, giving people advice as to where to invest their money. And really, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, re in retrospect... In retrospect, they should have locked me up. <laughs> <laughs> Today is easier. You just say, buy Apple. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. In retrospect, they should have really well, locked there's, me up. There's, famous, uh, there's uh, the famous experiments where they take a monkey and he throws darts at a, at a board uh, yes, of the yeah. stock options. Yeah. And if you invest, it's the same thing. So. No, I wasn't doing that. I actually... No, I, I looked around at all these new projects that were going on and I would have investors come to ask me what they should do and I would put them into these projects. And really new projects are generally a little bit risky. Yeah. They don't all work out. So uh, Some people still hold grudge. I, uh, to <laughs> some people still uh, come for you. Yeah. You owe us. Yeah, there are some people who don't think too kindly of me. <laughs> So now, unfortunately, because we don't have five hours with you, uh, the time is so precious, okay, we need to jump a few decades uh, in time to yeah. the 80s. Okay, so, uh, so let me just sort of jump a little. And um, uh, what happened was, first of all, in South Africa, I, I was very lucky. I had a few breaks, which actually enabled me to make money. And I... I put up a building in South Africa, and I just came to Israel knowing that I could buy a small meshek, a small uh, agricultural holding. Um, it was right. I, I decided to build a home on the beach, which I did, and, um, and, it, and, and, and it actually worked out. Uh, after about a year, I got involved in this bicycle factory. And in tr looking for projects that which cre which cre which would create employment for all these new immigrants who were coming to Israel, um, I had one lucky break. Uh, ITT, the biggest conglomerate at that time, came to Israel to go into the Yellow Pages. That's the eighties, right? It's the it's the eighties. That was, I think, in the. Late 70s, Late 70s, maybe early 80s. Yes. <clears throat> uh, there was a tender. And uh, somehow I met the person by chance who was actually representing them, and I gave him some advice as to what to do. It was uh, a very simple tender. And ITT were the biggest people in the world for Yellow Pages. They made an offer which was actually the most competitive offer. And they lost the bid. And um, I was a little bit disappointed. And I discovered that actually there was bribery. It was actually, it was corrupt. And I was offended. And I decided to actually fight the government. And actually I fought to have the tender reversed. Reheard and reversed. And on the reversed, ITT got the contract. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we need to explain our listeners, who pr many of them may, might not know how it looked like in the 80s, but in the 80s, correct me if I'm wrong, in the late 70s, phones were just like private phones at home was just an emerging, emerging thing in Israel. Yeah, actually it was difficult to get a telephone. You'd have to wait a long time. Uh, private homes were actually a luxury. Um, uh, Israel was sort of in a very early stage, but uh, uh, coming back to the question of, the, of this, uh, this ITT pro project, um, I felt that they had been misled and uh, they, should have got, they should have won the contract. I fought the battle for them. It was, it's a long story. We don't, don't have time for that. And I actually succeeded in getting the contract for ITT. And uh, when they got the contract, the representative came to Israel, thanked me for what I'd done, and uh, asked me how much he owed me. And I said, you owe me absolutely nothing. 
he said, but uh, you've got this contract for us. And I said, I felt that you were being treated badly and uh, it was unjust. And uh, I really have a sense, a strong sense of justice. And um, I did it because I, as, as, as upset as it, I felt it was the right thing to do. He said, we're prepared to pay you. And I said, I'm not prepared to take any money. That's not what I do. Although I could have done with the money. And then he said, we'd like you to run the business. Would you, you know, to manage our business? And I said, no, I don't think so. And he said, why? I said, look, you think people in Israel know what the yellow pages are. <laughs> they, they don't. You think you're going to make money. <laughs> you're not going to make any money. And uh, there's no fun in running a business which loses money. So he, he, he said, well, so why did you work to get us the contract? I said, because you have the right to do business in my country. But if you don't know what you're doing, that's not my problem. That's yours. <laughs> you don't have the right to succeed. So he said to me, you know, you're a little bit weird. <laughs> he said, well, we'll show you that it is a business. So I said, well, if you do that, I'd consider it. But really, I don't have any experience in, 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 in this business. He said, we'll train you. I said, look, I'm a fairly independent person and I can't be told what to do every day and I'd have you guys breathing down my necks. He said, no, we'll give you, we'll give you, we'll give you a lot of autonomy. I said, well, in which case I'll take the job. So he said, you know, you are weird. <laughs> so it's like said, a lesson in the power <coughs> of attraction. It's I like said, you know, why am I weird? He said, look, you've just agreed to take a job. You haven't asked me what salary you're going to get. Anyway, to cut a long story, I told him what I wanted. He thought it was pretty high. And I said, look, it's, you know, that's what I'm worth. You don't owe me anything. Don't feel bad. It's fine. That's what I'm worth. If it's good for you, take it. If it's not, don't. But don't, you owe me nothing. Anyway, so they gave me what I wanted. The contract came. What I'd asked for was in Israeli lira. And he thought I was talking in dollars. And he gave me that amount in dollars, which was three and a half times what I'd asked for. <laughs> so that actually turned out pretty well. And uh, what was the business? How how can you make money from Yellow Pages in Israel in the eighties? Because the Yellow Pages, you print the telephone book and you um, you sell advertising. The first line really is pretty is actually free, by and large, and. Uh, they sell advertising, you've got to pay for advertisements, and the advertisements turn out to, to be more. It's like, uh, you know, like Facebook. Uh, well, I'll tell you, how do you think Google makes money? They give you all the service for free. How do you think they make money? By selling advertising. It's exactly the same, the same system. And the advertisements <coughs> would work in the Golden Pages? People would actually make well, businesses Well, I'll tell you what happened. Money? What happened was that the war broke out. The 67 war broke out. Uh, no, the Yom Kippur war broke out. Oh, probably sh the, the northern, the, Leb the first Lebanon war. Yeah, no, no, no. no? I'm talking 1973, ah, the, okay. uh, the Yom Kippur war broke okay. out. Um, I closed the company down. Uh, our troops were fighting. People were dying. There was no communication between the front and the civilian population. And uh, I actually converted the company into a communications network with a telex in Kunetra and another telex in Fayed. Actually, first of all, on this side of the, of the, of the canal and afterwards in Fayed. And I would, send, I would send teams out to go and speak to the soldiers in the field. And they would actually give us a message to their families. And we would then give them some goodies, some newspapers or, or chocolates or whatever, or food, you know, to the soldiers in the field. And we would get the messages back to their families. And every message that we got through was really heartbreaking because we'd phone somebody and say, your son Chaim is alive, he sends you his love, and we saw him today. And for the families, that was a tremendous relief. Every, every telephone call ended up with the other side crying, crying in joy. And um, 
when the war was over, the uh, the representative of ITT came down and he said, what did you do when, when the war broke out? Well, first of all, every month I used to get a telex, which would actually have how we ran the company. But when the war started, that broke down and there was nothing, silence. There was silence from ITT. So when he heard that I'd spent money on it, he said, how much you spent on this project? I said, $200,000. He said, without public, without, uh, without permission? I said, yes. If you want me to run this like an ugly American company in Israel, I'm out. But otherwise, I'm in. So he said, no, no, you did fine. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we got 50,000 messages to families during that period. And after the war, people said, when my salesman came to see them, they said, you guys are from the Yellow Pages. I remember you from the war. So we really got this company going and going and established. Wow. But they lost my loyalty because they just, they had no interest in us and our problems during the war. They should have contacted us and said, how are you doing? Did anybody get hurt? Can we give you any assistance? But there was nothing. And it was too, so too much at business. At that point, they lost my loyalty and that finally cost them the business. They uh, they were going to get a contract with um, with Saudi Arabia. They had to sign an agreement that they uh, they had no business in Israel, and they did. And so they had to sell the business. It was difficult for them to sell it because that would also be giving in to the Arab boycott. And I was able to acquire the business, mm. and that was for me a lucky break. And that was how I really started. My empire. That, that, that lucky break put me on my feet, and uh, from then on, it was just. Did, plain was, did you take a risk buying the company from them, or was uh, it? Uh, yeah, yes, I took a risk, and uh, I didn't really. It it it, it, it was. Some people said you're crazy. Was, it was a bit of a stretch, mm -hmm. but uh, I felt I felt it was right. It was the right thing to do, and, and it worked out fine. So I guess you don't believe in the whole mantra of not mixing business with family or with, you know, bi your business and your personal lives. Meaning it, when there's a tragedy, then those walls should break down. Business isn't just business. Um, I really believe, uh, personally, you know, what happens is when you have family in business, your considerations, if you're very lucky and you have got a family relationship and children who have got that ability and they're comfortable with you, because children really feel a little bit uncomfortable with their fathers being telling them what to do. Um, we've actually, and, and I had a partner, and we decided not to put our children in the business so that we would not have a conflict later as the children grew up and mm -hmm. wanted to come into our business. But I'm actually asking because I'm, uh, the, the reaction that you had to the, uh, to the Golden Pages yeah. and how they didn't show any empathy yeah. with, uh, with what, had being, what, what was going on in Israel. Yes. So do you, you feel like business isn't just business? It's not just some cold thing that you're supposed to deal with? Like people should... <coughs> No, I think I think business should not just be a cold business. I think business should be you're part of a society. You're you're actually you you've you've got to really you've got to work you've got to you've got to really do something which is part of the whole rhythm of the society that you're actually in. I think just to look upon a business as making money per se, I think it's. I, I think it's a shame. I think you lose you lose the point, and frankly, I think that you don't really have that real committed thrust to do something. You'll find the people who believe that they're making a change, like Leon, like Elon Musk, when he's doing this, when he's doing what he's doing with the te Tesla, he wasn't just making a a motor car. He wasn't just making a better motor car. He wanted to change the paradigm. He wanted to, to do something to reduce the, the pollution that, it was, that oil was giving him. 
And this really gives you the thrust to really do a good job. You feel good with yourself, convinced in what you're doing, and then you're much more successful. He, al he also chose to produce in America. Sorry? Elon Musk also chose to produce his cars in America. Yeah. Which is also not an obvious uh, uh, I don't choice know. Cars being produced in America for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> but so, uh, but do you th like? Not everybody is on the bleeding edge of technology. So I want to ask you if even someone who is, I don't know. No, actually, you know, a lot of people are on the bleeding edge. Yeah, now a lot yeah. Of, most people are not on the leading edge. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> most some, most people are on the bleeding. Most people are bleeding out. But uh, but even someone who's I don't know, creating, uh, you know, the CEO of Pepsi. Like, yeah. do you think that they have some kind of social responsibility? I think they should have. I think they should have because on one hand, it actually, they get their employees with them. The employees don't feel that we're just working for the company and we're going to get as much as we can out for as little, as little in as possible. And I think if, if where they're working with the community and for the community, and it it does some good, not just making money for the for the owners, I think I think it's a win-win situation. In fact, I'm convinced it's a win-win situation. Which leads us um, to one of your most famous endeavor here in Israel, at least, which is Space IL. Uh, how how did this? How I did you hear about it for the okay, first time? I, th I think that I'm known better for the underwater observatory in a lot. Uh, well, <laughs> both I of them are uh, equally cool. Okay. So okay. Well, first of all, I built an underwater observatory in a lot, which is really uh, it was the first one in the world where we could take people underwater to see the coral, see the fish, and. Uh, they don't have to be divers or snorkelers or even swimmers. And it's turned out to be a fin. I did that as to get people to see the beauty of the underwater life. But it turned out to be a very good business. And we've actually built projects, marine projects around the world. And that by that business, right, by the way, is my son's. I've given okay. it to him. And that's his business. Now coming to Space Isle. How did you first hear about this? Well, uh, first of all, I'm a member of a group called the Sea Space Symposium. It's a, in the United States. It's a group of people who um, who've actually, who are involved in the ocean and in space. Uh, Buzz Aldrin is one of our people. A lot of the uh, a lot of our members are they come from NASA. They're either people at the universities working on marine life. Or there are people working in the uh, in the space space industry, and somehow I met them because of my interest in in aquariums. And I made a presentation to them once at one of their meetings, and they invited me to join, and I did. And we go diving twice a year, and together at different parts of the world, and we get together and we have a chat, and so I became exposed to this business of space. And uh, at some point, it struck me it would be nice if Israel actually put a spacecraft on the moon. And uh, what happened was there were three young boys, and uh, they heard that there was a Google competition to put a sp for a private group, not a government, to put a spacecraft on the moon for a prize of $20 million dollars. So they sat down in a bar and had a, had a couple of drinks and uh, sketched out and worked out a, a business plan and a sketch. And uh, they came up with a project for $8 million to put a spacecraft on the moon. And uh, I went to a lecture at the Tel Aviv University. The uh, director of NASA came down. And these three youngsters got up at this lecture period and they announced that they were going to participate in this project for Israel. And I thought, now that's cool. So I went up to them, congratulated them, and I asked them if they had any money and they said, no, we don't have any money. So I said, well, how are you going to do it? They said, well, we hadn't thought about money. I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> I said look, 
come to my office and I'm going to give you $100,000, no questions asked, and start. So I gave them this $100,000, and that's how I sucked myself into this crazy <laughs> you idea. You fed the uh, stray of, cat. <laughs> of putting a spacecraft on the moon. They began wow. to work, and then I realized that they tried to raise money, and they actually couldn't. And I helped them raise money, and then I put the money in, and uh, and then I realized that they really needed an engineer and a team to work with, and and so I really got in, involved in the project, and I got more deeply involved in the project as we as we progressed. At a certain and point, the deadline for the Google competition. Uh, no, right? there was there was no timeline, and what happened was. We did this project right on for eight years, and uh, Google got a little bit tired of this whole thing, <laughs> and they abandoned their uh, they abandoned their prize, and uh, the project turned out to be a hundred million dollar project, wow. and not eight million dollars, and I got raised, started raising money from people, and. Uh, we we got stuck very often, and I felt bad because I'd taken money from people, and I I used to lose sleep at night. And uh, eventually, my partner said, "Look, if you're really losing so much sleep, why don't you just put your hand in your pocket and uh, put up the money?" <laughs> I thought, "Well, that's a that's a cool idea." <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it, I I I ended up putting in about fifty million dollars. Uh -huh. I saved the company periodically in crises that actually arose. Got them a manager. There were there were some really critical points. I really helped put that project through, mm -hmm. and we really got the spacecraft to the moon. You did, yeah, Bill Sheath in 2019. We were the first private group to put a spacecraft on the moon. Now, when I say put. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice Throw way of at, putting yeah. it. We got it there, but not, but not in one show, not in not in one piece. Yeah. But is, it, the world recognized that Israel got to the moon, and we got there in a very innovative way. We couldn't afford a rocket that would take us up into up into the moon. We could actually get a tramp on on a on one of the rockets going up to to launch satellites. And then from there we'd have to find our own way, and what we did was we got this, we got the spacecraft of ours, going around a, a circuit round the round the Earth in a bigger and bigger circuit, until it got to the gravitation field of the Moon, and then it pulled it got pulled into the gravitation circle of the Moon. So it did Field kind of, of the a moon. figure eight. So we we did it we did it the cheap way. Yeah. It didn't wow. it didn't cost us very much in fuel, and we managed to 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 get it there without having a rocket to actually do it. Can you describe how it felt? How it felt the. I want to tell it, you. Seeing first it go of all, to the air first. Of what all. happened was there was tremendous excitement at Israel, a little country, putting a spacecraft on the moon. Not the country, but a private group of private group of people, and uh, I, I arranged a party for the workers and people who donated money and and people who were involved, and we were very excited. The prime minister was there, and we were watching this thing, and it was going to land and going to land, and suddenly disappeared off the off the screen, and we realized very quickly that it had crashed. And I told the engineers when you announced it, don't say we crashed. Say we had a hard landing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, these guys said it crashed. Anyway, I felt very bad. I took the microphone and I said, we're going to launch another project to the moon. And that actually got everybody excited again. And then when the dust settled, I realized that the world recognized that Israel got to the moon. Mm -hmm. It's true we had a hard landing, but we really got to the moon, and that was an achievement. I think yeah. one of the uh, I think one of the incredible bits about like the the most incredible part about it for me is that more than around the world, I think it probably inspired many. I mean, it was a huge deal in Israel; everybody was watching yeah. it, and I think it probably inspired a lot of kids. 
to go and you know study math or study science. Oh, I tell you, we made a we made a we made a decision that we would actually educate and really excite the young people of Israel to get involved in science and mathematics and and STEM. And uh, I tell you, when 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 our rocket went up, there wasn't a child in Israel of of reasonable age who didn't stay up to to watch it. The excitement was terrific, and I think we achieved our purpose of really exciting the young people in Israel to get involved in mathematics and science and, and space. It's pretty it's incredible. Amazing. Yeah, really it's incredible. Uh, we can't wait for the next project, but she too, right? Uh, we're, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. But you know, I can't tell you, you mentioned Elon Musk, and you, you know, he's doing amazing things also in space. Uh, Elon launch. Musk? Yes. Elon Musk is absolutely doing amazing things. If you understand the complexity of what he's doing, his achievements are truly amazing. But you could compete with him. Uh, Both from South yeah. Africa. It'd uh, be a pretty tight rivalry. Don't you feel an, an itch? My ambition <laughs> in life is not to compete with Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I may be stupid, but I'm not that stupid. <laughs> Do you think there's something about... I mean, it's interesting that you're both from South Africa. Do you think there's something about adversity that, uh, that led you to success? The fact that you grew up in a place that was so rough. The fact that... You lived in Israel you, in the in the fifties. I'll tell you, I really in South Africa, I basically had a lot of luck. Um, there was a store. It, it was a, I, I actually had to leave university. I actually went to study social science, and I had to leave university when the government changed, and I then went into business, and uh, and and it was actually tough. I want to ask you about your your vitality right what 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 makes you tick what makes you so energetic you know we're sitting here in the evening you must have had a very long day how does your day look like and how what I don't really know what makes me tick but really there is something that makes me tick there's something that drives me and you know I, if I see something which is exciting I get excited and I get excited very easily and uh, and I follow things through and it gives me a tremendous amount of satisfaction it's just it's just the way I am would you say there's something like pure and naive in you that gets excited uh, and I think there's I think people have said I've got this curiosity and I've got this curiosity and I with the and also I carry with it and an ability to follow through. It's mm-hmm. not just that I'm curious. If it's curious, I'll do something about it. And I'm involved in a lot of medical research, mm-hmm. and I really don't have any background in medical science. But I, there are a lot of exciting things. We, were, we, we heard that you gave yourself a gift for your 18th birthday. Yes, I did. Can you tell <clears throat> us about you that? You know, um, on my 80th birthday, I decided to get to give myself a gift, and the, what happened was I'd met a friend who had done some work in Africa. He was an uh, he was a uh, an ophthalmologist, and he said, "Look, we've got there are a lot, lot, lot of people in in Africa who who are blind as a result of trachoma and uh, cataracts, and uh, I jo- I periodically go and I I do a little work sort of helping them and." doing a couple of, of, of operations. So I said, how long does an operation take? He said, about 25 minutes. I said, if you, can, if you can actually do an operation in 25 minutes, I think it's not a nice thing to go and do it. I think it's a crime not to do it. So for my 80th birthday, I took him and a group of volunteers, and we went to a place in Ethiopia, Jinka, it's on the southernmost part of uh, Ethiopia. It's the middle of nowhere. They have no electricity. They have no running water. They've got. They had no roads. It's just a. It's really. It's it's wild country, and uh, we went down and we actually got together with the, with with the 
some people who'd worked there, <clears throat> and we actually did 600 operations in that, in, in that period. <clears throat> and the exhilaration that we got from doing operations and seeing these people coming to you in this terrible condition and leaving you being able to see and being able to walk without being led, you change their lives. And there's some, sometimes they'll bring you a child that has never opened his eyes. And uh, the mother will bring it, and the other child only knows the warmth of his mother's breast. And you take the child, and the child with a scream, but you do an operation, you know, open the child's eyes, and, and the child will walk the following day. And, the exhilaration you get from something like that, you, I can't describe it to you. You, wow. you can't buy that for money. That's one hell of a gift. You can't buy it for money. So we, we did all these operations, and, uh, and then I decided I'm going to do it every year, and we've done it every year since then. And uh, anybody who comes with us, on these expeditions, they come back exhilarated by what they've done. The conditions there are hard. We don't. Have, there are no hotels. The, you, we live in the bush. You live in kind of a little tent, tent, tent hotel. And uh, what do I tell you? You. It was. It was really the best. The best birthday present that I've ever had. That's really incredible. It really is. Um, and this isn't the only thing that you're involved in <clears throat> philanthropically. I think there's something, there's, I mean, we, we said it, we mentioned it in the intro, but you've had countless philanthropic endeavors where you've helped research and you help children. And a big focus is children. Is there, I, is that, does that have some special meaning to you to help children? Let me tell you that I've actually, I've just come now from a, a meeting in, in the other room. And that meeting was actually for a new project called Inclusive Schools. Mm -hmm. And in this project, we have a, we've developed a project which we take children who have some kind of disability and some kind of a learning disability. And normally these children are laughed at in the class. And when a child is laughed at, he develops a very bad self-image. A child with a poor self-image will never be anything. Their lives are over. What we do in these, in these schools, we actually put, we put people in, train them, they go to the parents, they know the child, and they get the other children sympathetic to these children who have difficulties. And two things happen. One, the child who is now helped by his classmates feels good. And the one who is helping him feels good that he's done something. They are going to be better citizens. And the children who were, had, had some kind of difficulty, they actually will be normal citizens. So this project is really a wow. fabulous project. And this is something I just came out of a, a conference now. And it's, it's going beautifully. And we're going to change this, the educational system in Israel. And I believe, as a side benefit, we're going to change the culture of Israel. Because these children are going to grow up em with empathy for, mm -hmm. the, for those who are actually less fortunate than they are. Do you think there's, a, there's maybe a problem of empathy, meaning... In Israeli culture, in Israeli society, do you I feel? think that Israeli culture is a little bit tough, a little bit rough. Um, Sabras. As a matter of fact, you know, I think my son was at school, and he's my the teacher came and said, "Look, I think you should put him into a lower class." And I said, "Why?" They said, "Because he he doesn't stand up and fight, and he's he's sort of he's soft." Uh, you see, that was a quality that was not really respected, even by the teacher. So, yes, I think, there's, I think that life in Israel is perhaps, and also where the people came from, the cultures from which they came, they brought with them cultures. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a little bit rough. It's a little bit tough. It really is. And I think that we will do something to change the paradigm in Israel. 
in innovation and uh, technology, uh, what in science, what would you say is your biggest dream of next? Well, I tell you, as far as the dream is concerned, I am very excited about this educational project. Um, I'm, I'm involved in a couple of, uh, of uh, medical projects that, I, that I, really, I really hope work out. We've, there's a scientist at the Tel Aviv University who I've supported. She, she, was, she was able to create a tumor a glioblastoma, which is a brain tumor, in the lab with 3D printing, wow. using the stem cells of the person who had it. And this has given us, and it's, it's a viable tumor, together with the blood system, nervous system, everything. And this has given us the possibility of checking the viability of the drug treatment that that person is actually getting. Without having to actually without having administer. To do, without having to get into his brain. Mm -hmm. And um, this would, if we're now in the process of doing proof of concept, and if this concept really works, we found a technique, I believe, of helping oncologists devise, decide on the correct drug for that particular cancer. That's incredible. That's incredible. And that's incredible, and the woman who's doing it uh, Ronit Sachi Fanaro, <laughs> Ronit Fanaro. She is she's from the Tel Aviv University. She's a fabulous person. She is the one who's actually done it, and uh, I've now supported her for another project that we're working on, and uh, I'm I'm really excited. I really am excited. Well, last last question I must ask you is for a young guy who listens to us, maybe just finished his service or in the States, just off college and wants to make it in business. What can you teach him a vital lesson about making it, about building a good business? There are two things. One, prepare yourself, you know, study, prepare yourself because it doesn't, doesn't just come from, from the, from, from the sky. <clears throat> And the second, the second piece of advice that I could give you is it's not a sin to fail. It's not a sin to fail. To fail is okay because what happens is young people are afraid of failure. As a matter of fact, I was once in interviewed in one of the projects that I'm involved in for, uh, for developing for developing uh, leadership in young people. And I was asked to, to go through my, you go through your life. And I was on the stage and I was doing it in front of them and somebody was interviewing me. And I, at the end of it, I said, you know, we've done a terrible thing. We've actually, I've talked to, I've talked about my life. They look up to me as some kind of a role model. And all I've told them is I failed so many times. So he said, you've done them a favor because they're all afraid of failure and you've shown them that it's okay to fail. So the two things I would say, prepare yourself and don't be put off by failure. Mr. Khan, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very thank you. inspiring. Thank you. And uh, let's, do this, th let's do this again in 10 years or if you're up for it. By all means, remember, After, I'm, uh, remember I'm 92 now. I'd <laughs> have a as they say, even yeah. more. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about the, uh, the Bereshit that didn't land so hard. Bereshit to <laughs> Mars. Yeah, <laughs> also true. Yeah, well, that's scheduled for 2000 and, and the end of 2024. So you can come back and we'll, we'll, we'll help review it again. Great. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming. Thank guys, thanks for listening. See you on the next one. Thank you. Bye, guys.